May I say by way of introduction to our study this evening that we have been engaged over the months of this year in a series of studies on Sunday evenings, helping us to understand central things in the Christian faith. We have been doing this in three segments or sections, and we've come to the third of these in which we are thinking together about the life of the Christian church, about the sacraments of the gospel, baptism, and the Lord's Supper, and about what Christians usually refer to as the four last things. And we've come this evening to think together about the Lord's Supper, and later on this evening we have the wonderful privilege of actually coming to and sharing in the Lord's Supper. Those of you who know me quite well would probably be able to guess that there is hardly an occasion in which we have the Lord's Supper here in our church. But I remember a story from the 19th century. Until about the middle of the 19th century in Scotland, particularly until the time of a very great Christian thinker, Dr. Thomas Chammers, in all of the churches in Scotland, at the time of the Lord's table, instead of all the people gathering together, the people would gather table by table. They would come and sit round, as sometimes still happens in Scotland, in smaller groups, the Lord's table. And so table after table of the Lord's Supper would be served in the sight of the whole congregation. It wasn't until the time of Thomas Chammers, who was minister in the Tron Church here, in the 19th century, that the whole church was turned into a communion table. And those of you who remember in past days coming into communion services here and elsewhere, and white linen being on every pew, will remember that that was the significance of that covering. It was that the whole church was seen as one table. But in those distant days, on one occasion a very eccentric but wonderful professor of Hebrew in the Free Church College in Edinburgh was conducting the Lord's Supper. And as the cup in the Lord's Supper moved round the table, he noticed that there was a woman who had come forward to the table in whose eyes were tears. And when she came to receive the cup, she paused with it and then obviously reluctantly passed it on to her neighbor without drinking from it. And when the cup came back round to John Duncan, he himself went round the table to the woman and thrust it into her hands and said, Take it, woman. It's for sinners. And the question I want us to try and think about together this evening and answer from God's Word in the light of that wonderful story is this. What is in the cup for sinners? Some of us have come to the Lord's table more times than we can remember, countless numbers of times. But what is it about the Lord's Supper that is so special to us? What is it that God has given us in the Lord's Supper? What is in the cup for sinners? Or if I can put it in the form of a child's question, what is there for supper? And here in these two sections of Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, I want to try to draw together a series of words that he uses, very simple words really, that will help us all from the very young to the very old to grasp the fact that there is something here in the Lord's Supper which our Lord Jesus Christ has deliberately added to the preaching of the gospel so that we may get to know him better. We saw last Sunday evening that all down through history, God has given his people signs. His word of promise is, of course, true, but he adds to that word of promise, as we often do, to our words of promise, signs by which he symbolizes the promise that he is giving and seals to us 
as we receive that promise, the truth of it and the power of it and the experience of it. And so in the Old Testament, signs like the rainbow in the sky or circumcision when God made his covenant with Abram, these signs, these physical signs God gave to his people and through them pledged himself to bring to them the very blessings that he had promised in his covenant word. So when we come to the Lord's table, as Paul teaches us here, it is the same. He is trying to help these Corinthians who become very hazy and confused about the real meaning of the Lord's Supper, and that was so evident from the way in which they were behaving at the Lord's Supper. There was a vital importance for them to understand what was in the cup for sinners, what was for supper for Christians who trusted in Jesus Christ. And as we come ourselves later to the Lord's table, then we're able to think about these things and see what God wants us to see in the significance of this sign so that it will open up to us in a marvelous way and give us a richer, fuller, fresher glimpse of Jesus Christ, that by faith we may take him the more surely for ourselves, not getting any different Jesus in the Lord's Supper than we get when we listen to the teaching of his word, but as he adds to his word the sign, the visible expression of the truth of the gospel we are able to take a firmer grasp of the gospel and our lives be strengthened by his grace and by the wonder of his power. Now, there are five words that I want to underline in what Paul is saying here to the Corinthians, and the first is this, that the Lord's Supper is proclamation. The Lord's Supper is proclamation. Notice what he says in chapter 11, verse 26. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In our ordinary services, there is usually one voice, perhaps two or three voices at most, that proclaim the Lord's death and the Lord's word. The thing that is distinctive about The Lord's Supper, says Paul, is that in the Lord's Supper, we are all proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. And we do this in a most wonderful way. We first take the bread and we break it. We pour out the wine and we offer it. And all this is a little acted drama setting before us what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. As surely as this bread is broken, Christ's body has been broken on the tree. As surely as this wine is poured out, our Lord Jesus Christ's blood has been poured out for our sin. So that in this miniature way that is set before us, to our very eyes, God, as it were, in this dramatic way, sets before us Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul reminds the Galatians at one point that when he had been with them, he had placarded Jesus Christ before them as crucified. And that's what happens in the Lord's Supper. Jesus Christ, in all that he has done for our salvation, in the cruelty and reality and the substitutionary nature of his death, is set before us in this simple way which we ourselves share in and then proclaim in this visible way to each other. And marvelously, not only what Jesus Christ has done for us, but in this proclamation of the gospel, we give to one another a visible demonstration of how each of us may enjoy the benefits of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And so later this evening, our elders will come to you and they will put into your hands this broken bread and this poured out wine. And they will say, drink and eat. This is for you. And as we eat and drink, we proclaim the wonder not only of what Christ has done for us, we proclaim the simplicity of, what, how, of how what he has done for us may become ours. 
simply by reaching out and taking something a child could do. Just by reaching out and taking Jesus Christ crucified for our sins, raised for our justification, all that He has done for us can become ours. And in this little drama, together in a visible, physical way, we proclaim to each other the significance of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is why, although we do not invite non-Christians to share in the supper, it is not a supper for non-Christians. While we do not invite non-Christians to share in the supper, we are delighted if those who are not Christians are with us to observe this supper. Because in this little supper, what they may not fully have grasped as we have tried to explain it to them in our personal witness to them in the Christian gospel, what they may not have grasped when it has come simply to their ears, they may begin to grasp as they see it acted out before them. Broken body, shed blood, humble, penitent, sinful, ordinary men and women reaching up and taking hold of Jesus Christ for their salvation. So the Lord's Supper is first and foremost a proclamation of our Lord Jesus Christ as our great Savior. Secondly, Paul says, the Lord's Supper is a benediction. In 1 Corinthians 10, he says this to the Corinthians, verse 16, is not the cup, and if you're using the New International Version, it fails you rather badly here, I think, is not the cup literally of blessing or benediction, which we bless, over which we pronounce a benediction, a participation in the blood of Christ. The Apostle Paul sees the Lord's Supper as a time of blessing, not just a time of thanksgiving when we thank Christ for what He has done. It is a time of benediction, of blessing, when God blesses us through our fellowship with Jesus Christ. And that language for Paul as a Jew is tremendously significant. You will know from the gospel record that the Lord's Supper was instituted at the end of a family meal, a Passover meal. And it seems pretty clear in 1 Corinthians 11 that the early Christian church also had the Lord's Supper at the end of a meal. And in those Jewish meals, and we see this in the Gospels, there was a series of cups that would be passed round the table and drunk as the family and others shared together. That would have happened on the night of Jesus' crucifixion when he celebrated the Passover with his disciples. There were various cups that were passed round the table and they would drink from them. And the last of these was known as the cup of blessing. And it's fascinating to see as you read the gospel account of that first Lord's Supper that as Jesus takes that cup of blessing into his hands and says to his disciples, now drink from this cup of blessing, he then adds, I am not going to drink any more of this cup of blessing. And in Matthew's gospel, Mark's gospel, Luke's gospel, immediately after saying this, we are told how Jesus goes out with the disciples into the Garden of Gethsemane, and the next event that takes place is also an event that focuses upon a cup. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is praying, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And he's thinking about the judgment of God upon himself as he, the next day, is going to become the sin-bearer. He's thinking about all the things he knew intimately in the prophecies of the Old Testament that spoke about the way in which the wrath of God would be poured out like somebody drinking a cup to its last bitter dregs. So that in the drama of the Lord's Supper there on that night of Jesus' betrayal, he is himself enacting what lies at the very heart of the Lord's Supper, at the very heart of the Christian gospel, and what it is that brings blessing to men and women and boys and girls like ourselves. 
And it is quite simply this, that Jesus has changed places with us. Jesus has taken the cup which we should drink of God's judgment. And instead of drinking the cup of blessing to which he surely has exclusive rights, he gives that cup of blessing to his disciples and he says, now you know this is my cup. You know you have no title to this cup or to the blessing it symbolizes. But I am going to drink the cup of God's judgment in order that you may not have to drink it. And I am going to abstain from the cup of God's blessing in order that it may be given over to you. And this is what we are doing in the Lord's Supper. As the bread is broken, as the cup is brought to us. It is as though Jesus himself is saying to us, I took your cup, I ate your bread, the bread of sorrow and bitterness. Now let us change places. I have gone to the cross for you. I want you to go to heaven and to glory with me. Come now. Let's reenact the inner significance of what it means for you to become a child of God. And this marvelous exchange takes place that lies at the very heart of the gospel and at the very heart of the supper. And that's what makes it a benediction. It's not so much a benediction, you see, because when I come to the Lord's table, I'm able to summon up great thoughts about Jesus Christ. It's a benediction because when I come to the Lord's table, I begin to see with opened eyes that he has summoned up great thoughts about me in the marvel of his love for me, that he's been willing to change places with me. In my place, condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. No wonder as I take the bread and drink the wine, my heart is throbbing to cry, Hallelujah, what a Savior! So the Lord's Supper is proclamation. The Lord's Supper is also benediction. And in the third place, the Lord's Supper, says Paul, is communion. Again, in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, he uses this terminology. He says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving or blessing which we bless a literally communion, a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a communion a participation in the body of Christ. Now follow carefully what Paul is saying here. It is really wonderful. He is saying in some sense, when we come to the Lord's Supper and take the bread and drink the wine, we aren't simply doing something symbolic. The symbolism means something. At the Lord's table we are actually able to engage in living, loving communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. I've sometimes said to you, you know, that I do believe that those great words in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, probably refer to the Lord's Supper. Behold, says Jesus, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, then I will come in and sup with him, and he with me. And while he comes to us invisibly in the power of his Holy Spirit and brings us near to himself, this is what we're doing at the Lord's Supper. We're not sitting around a minister. We're not simply coming at the invitation of elders. We are sitting in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the host, invisible but real. And he invites us to come by faith and to enjoy actual communion with him in this way. Even in our ordinary world, we notice that signs function in different ways. There are some signs that point away from themselves to something that is locationally removed from them. If you had come into church this evening and just as you came in, you noticed there was somebody standing at the sign outside on the left-hand side of 
the door of the church as you come in. That sign says St. George's Tron across the top. Do you find somebody trying to clamber over the railings that are there to keep the sheep out, incidentally, and trying to sit on top of that sign? You would say, what are you doing? They might say, well, I've heard about this church, St. George's Tron. I came, just wanted to be at St. George's Tron, and here it is. You would say, no, no, that's not St. George's Tron. That's just a sign. And that sign is saying, St. George's Tron is further on through the door. You've got to go through the door. And then the other doors. And then you'll get into St. George's Tron. But there are other signs we use. We thought about this a little when we were speaking about baptism last week. We have signs we use that don't so much point to realities that are absent, but communicate realities that are present. We shake hands with one another. That isn't or certainly shouldn't be an empty sign. That's not just a sign of friendship. In that sign, we actually communicate friendship. We express our love for each other. We occasionally hug each other. In certain circumstances, we kiss each other. And these are signs by which we actually communicate the love that is in our heart. Paul is trying to help us to understand that the Lord's Supper is such. There is nothing magical about this bread and wine. It's ordinary bread and wine. You could buy it in any supermarket. There's nothing magical about it. And there's nothing magical we can do to it. But you see, when you understand that it is the Lord Jesus Christ who invisibly is pressing the bread into your hand, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ who is saying to you in his word, now drink from this cup of blessing, because I have drunk from your cup of cursing, then you begin to see that in the Lord's Supper, just as so often when you're listening to the Lord's Word, you sense there's a human voice, but it's disappeared. Christ himself is speaking to you. You have intimate communion with him. So it is in the Lord's Supper. He uses these ordinary pieces of bread, this ordinary wine, and he takes them up in his hand, and because They are, as it were, gifts from the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. By these means, we are able to enter into a living, loving, lively communion with Him. You see, we can only do that if we understand what the signs mean. We can only do that if we see that this bread and this wine in the hands of Jesus, they're actually saying something quite specific and clear to us. And we need to know how to read the signs. Let me give you an example. You go somewhere nice for a meal, and at the end of the meal, you remember what you were taught as a child, that the sign that you've finished, that you're not going to eat anymore, is that you lay your knife and fork down, straight up and down the plate, in parallel lines, and everybody will know you're finished. But many of you know, if you go and do that in the United States, the waitress will come along and say, are you finished? And if you don't know what's going on, you think to yourself, doesn't she know the etiquette? But you see, what you should do in the United States is put your knife and fork down in parallel lines, diagonally across your plate. If somebody comes up to you and rubs noses with you in the street in Glasgow, you, th- you think they've lost their senses. Not apparently if you do it in other parts of the world. You need to be able to read the signs. A friend of mine from the Middle East was showing me many years ago his wedding photographs. And as he raced through them, they were wonderful, med- wonderful wedding photographs. Suddenly, there he was on the day of his wedding, giving this other fellow a great big smacker on the lips. And he saw the look of astonishment in my eyes. Oh, he said, that doesn't mean what it would mean here. It's the same physical act, but it carries a different message. You can break bread any time you want. You can drink wine any time you want. You can go to the grocery store and buy exactly the same kind of loaf that this bread is here and exactly the same kind of grape juice that's in these 
flagons and in our communion vessels. But you see, it's only here when we break the bread and share the wine that we read the sign. And the sign is saying the most wonderful thing that you and I could ever hear. The sign is saying this to you. Jesus is saying, I love you this much. I died for you like this. I've risen because I want to have communion with you. I want to come in to your life and sit down with you and sup with you and you with me, not only to be your Savior, I want to be your companion and your friend. I want to be the love of your life. I don't ever want to leave you. I'll never forsake you. So it's proclamation, it's benediction, it's communion. And in the fourth place, says Paul, it's also consecration. And he puts this in two different ways. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 21, he says, you can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. What's he saying? Well, these Corinthians, it seems, belonged to various guilds in the city of Corinth, and as they went to the dinners, there, there would be the, the sacrificial offering, a libation of wine that would be offered to the particular god of the guild. And the whole feast would have been seen as taking place under the auspices of that God. And Paul is saying, you know, if you're going to come to the Lord's table and drink the Lord's cup and give this visible evidence that you live the whole of your life under the Lord's auspices, there has got to be a very distinct consecration of your life to Christ and a separation from all other devotions. That must have been immensely costly in a place like Corinth. That presumably could have lost you your job in a place like Corinth, as is tonight true in many other parts of the world. But you can't come and by this sign say to Jesus Christ, my Jesus, I love you. All I have is yours. And then go out and drink from other cups and eat and drink other bread that is the bread of this world that denies your commitment, your profession of faith in Jesus Christ. And so to come here is visibly to say to those who sit around you, I am exclusively Jesus Christ. There are other proper loves in my life, but there is no other improper love in my life, but my love for the Lord Jesus Christ is paramount. It is non-negotiable. It is not shared with another. I will not sully it. It is as sacred as any bond could ever humanly be. And then do you notice he says there's another side to this. He puts it like this. He says here, don't you understand, verse 17 of chapter 10, that because there is one loaf that has been broken down into many pieces, each of which we take, then by taking these pieces, which come from the one loaf, we're giving expression. As we come to the Lord's Supper, one by one, we're giving expression to the fact that we all belong to the one loaf. We are members of the one body. So that the consecration that is expressed in the drama of the Lord's Supper is not only my consecration vertically to the Lord Jesus Christ, it is my consecration and commitment horizontally to those who sit beside me at the table. I join one hand, as it were, to Jesus Christ and take hold of Him by faith. I join another hand to my fellow believers and take hold of them by love. And I say, just as in Christ, I am part of that one loaf, so my life is committed to you. That's why none of us should ever go away from the Lord's table with a spirit of alienation against another member of our fellowship. That's why the heart-melting character of really coming and finding the Lord and the Lord's Supper is such a means of blessing to us in enabling us to love, to care for, to 
commit ourselves to our fellow believers. So yes, it's certainly proclamation. Yes, it's certainly benediction. Yes, it really is communion. Yes, it calls us to consecration. And finally, says the Apostle Paul, it is a supper of intense anticipation. Chapter 11, verse 26. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You see, he's saying there's a backward look in what we do. We are remembering the Lord's death and we are proclaiming what he has done for it. There is an upward dimension to this Lord's Supper because we are here to have communion with our risen and exalted and yet present Lord Jesus Christ. And there is a forward dimension to the Lord's Supper. The very way in which we celebrate the Lord's Supper is an indication, a dramatic indication to us that this isn't the final fellowship. These small pieces of bread, these sips of wine, in their very nature, they are saying to us, this isn't, this isn't the final fellowship. It's real, it's glorious, it's precious, but it's not final. Because here we are, as it were, simply practicing. This is a full dress rehearsal for that final marriage supper of the Lamb in which all the blessing of all the Lord's suppers we ever attended will pale into insignificance by the fact that we will no longer need bread and wine literally to see the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. They have, I guess it depends on your point of view, but if you're a visitor and a guest, they have a wonderful tradition in many parts of the United States of having a wedding rehearsal dinner. I say it depends on your point of view because that dinner is the responsibility of the father, of the groom, not the parents of the bridegroom. The rehearsal dinner. It's not the wedding reception. But it can be a marvelous occasion looking forward to the consummation of love and the full celebration of it on the next day. And that's what this is. It is our wedding rehearsal dinner as we anticipate the full blessing and joy of the final banquet of our never-ending fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ. We taste and see in miniature here symbols. We view imperfectly the wonder of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we do this in the full anticipation of the time when the veil will be taken from our eyes, when faith will be turned into sight, and the full glory of our Lord Jesus Christ will be visible and enjoyed by all of his people. And every time we come to the Lord's table, he says, now come to me. But this is not yet how we shall finally be. Isn't that something? The whole of the Christian gospel, the whole of Christian experience, as it were, in a little drama that you could reenact anywhere in the world in the simplest possible way. Any Christian church could do this. And Jesus has given it to us because he wants all of his people to the ends of the earth until he comes again to be able to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Perhaps you're here this evening and you've been in our church for some time as a younger person. You've sometimes come and watched what the grown-ups have been doing. You've wondered what it all means. Well, this is what it means. It means that your mother and your father and these other grown-up people are coming to this table and in their hearts they are singing, Jesus loves me. 
and I love him. And he's giving me his kiss of love. And I'm taking it with all my heart. You could do that, couldn't you? You could come to Jesus. You could see in broken bread the sign that Jesus' body has been broken. In these cups of wine that Jesus' blood has been shed in order that our sins could be forgiven. You could understand that, couldn't you? But are you trusting him? Are you observing him? Or are you trusting him? Do trust him. Won't you trust him? Some of us here, you know, we are old and we are gray-haired and some of us are even stooped. And we've trusted Jesus ever since we were your age. And he's never let us down. He's never failed us. He's been with us all, all our days. And that could be you too. And Jesus shows you tonight how it could be for you. And there may be some of us who have come to innumerable Lord's Suppers. But we've never actually come to the Lord's Supper. We've taken the bread and we've taken the wine And in our hearts, we've wondered, why on earth do we do this? And we've not been able to read the sign. Because you see, you need faith to be able to see the sign. To understand its meaning. To reach into it. And to say, ah, it's about Jesus. I'm going to take hold of Jesus. And some of us tonight are bound to be quite far away from Jesus. Although we trust him, we've sought to follow him. We are far away from Jesus. And we don't feel we've got a mechanism by which we can come back. And here he's giving us one tonight. As the bread comes to you, as the wine comes to you. No one else but Jesus himself and you going to know what's going on, but you say as the bread and the wine comes to you, Lord Jesus, I know that you did all this for me. And I've been far from you. Far, far from you. I'm grieved and I'm hard-hearted and I don't know what to do. But won't you take me into this meal? And then you can sort it all out. So this is the Lord's Supper. And through faith, we can have communion, real communion with Jesus Christ. Let's pray together that we may. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word helps us to understand the meaning of your signs. And we pray tonight as we come to the Lord's table that you would open the eyes of our understanding that we may see through the bread to the broken body of our Savior and through the wine to his shed blood. And in this little drama, we pray that Christ will come to us and that we will have communion with him. And this we pray in his name. Amen.